Hi, Mitchell Levy, Global Credibility Expert, and uh, I am so excited about interviewing people in the Leaders Living Their Value series. Um, what's coming out is really spectacular, and and I want to welcome to stage David Cohen. Nice to nice to have you join us. My pleasure, honored. Thank you hey, very much. So, oh, it's so cool. We we share the. Um, the the Marshall Goldsmith, the 100 Coaches uh, organization together. And, and I enjoyed getting to, to meet you and spend time with you. And I thought, hey, why don't you come on the air and let's chat? And so I want to throw over the, it's sort of a softball question, but hi, who are you? Who am I? That's a good question. I'm David S. Cohen, because there's too many of us in the phone book, or the former phone book, a uh, very common name. Um, I've been in consulting for 33 years. Before that, I was in education. I focus on, I guess all the time, on ethics, values, and behaviors, focus mostly on behaviors, trying to help leaders make the organization as great as the people inside them, and work with organizations. I've worked on five continents and work with large organizations, small, multinationals, and been married as of three days ago, 51 years. 51 have, years? Awesome. Have two boys who are obviously older and five grandchildren. That's the last part to I really am. There's a mm. difference between what I do and who I am. I appreciate that. I was hoping you were going to get to the, the really cool important stuff. I'm still going to say 51 years. That's amazing. I don't know how my wife, well, my wife always says net 25 because I used to be on the road so much, you know, I've accumulated 4 million air miles. So she says net 25. So we're kind of like always getting to know each other. <laughs> I, I'm kind of thinking you guys are, are, are both like to poke fun at each other. Um, yeah, well, she, she's very good at it. Hmm. That's interesting. So you're not good at it yourself? You, this seems like something that you'd be up your alley. Uh, a give and take. It's a give and take. Let's put it on. You know, if because we're talking about values, what what would be the for you? What are the values that pop to mind? What what's core to you? Okay, so um, values are my first. Let me begin with my definition of values because most people, I think. There's two words that are overused today in corporate settings. One's values and the other is culture. And they're used so freely, they mean so many different things to so many different people. So my values are my strongly held beliefs that are emotionally charged, resist change, and applied universally regardless who you are in this world. So there's no hierarchy and there's no status Everybody gets treated the same way. I would say mine are caring, learning, um, definitely family. And I would say that caring, learning, family, and justice would be the four values that I, you know, go by. I like it. Caring, learning... Family. I missed one in the middle. Justice. Justice. Oh, at the end. Mm -hmm. Huh. Okay. I got the learning. Learning is always being coachable, always learning. Uh, family. Tell me about justice a little bit to you. What does that yeah, mean? Justice to me, well, you have to, you know, some people are born into families that are mathematically inclined. Some are born into families that have generations of ownership of an organization. I was born into a family of social justice. Um, my father and both my mother, before they even knew each other, were involved in it back in the 30s and 40s. And I, therefore, what I heard about since I can remember was about to do justice means to treat people the way that you would like to be treated, to make sure that other people are not treated in a way that is disrespectful 
a way that doesn't take into account who they are, where they come from. And just to show the DNA of that, my father wrote an article in Yank Magazine in 1940 uh, when he was in the Army on why do American soldiers not understand why they're fighting this war? And when in a following issue, he was asked, what is he fighting for? He's fighting for liberty and to end Jim Crow laws, to which two weeks later, two people tried to kill him on the base. Um, so I, when I was 16 years old, got on a bus and by myself with a church group, went to Washington, D.C. in August of 63 and joined Dr. King and marched on Washington. So it's something that's deeply ingrained in my DNA. And it's something that rattles my nerves when people are not treated the way I believe they should be treated. How did that feel for you um, way back way back when? Like, what, did, what impact did that have uh, joining the march? Oh, it was exhilarating because I met friends of mine that were also coming from different parts of New Jersey because I lived in Jersey at the time. And we got together and we marched with the National Federation of Temple Youth, NIFTY. And um, it was just to see all these people walking together and having a joyous time, but a serious time for a cause that really was about 100 years overdue, uh, or not 200 years overdue, uh, was really exhilarating. And it was a beautiful day. And I almost missed the bus on the way back because I didn't remember where they parked. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it was just an exhilarating day. It says, I'm doing the right thing. I'm in the right place. And by today's standards, it was a small march, only about 250,000 people. Hmm. Must have been amazing. I, I, I don't think I've ever been in something like that. That would have been really fascinating. Yeah, I, I was young. Um, I was excited. Um, so it was, um, it was a good, it was, it was a meaningful time. Curious about how do you bring your values into the coaching you do with your clients? Uh, well, I basically suspend my values because it's not about me. It's about my coach. It's about my client. It's not about me. And as long as my clients don't have values that violate my belief system, uh, I have no problem with it because there's no right answer or wrong answer to what a value is. Uh, some people value uh, certain things, which I find abhorrent. And other people probably think that my look outlook on life is way too open-minded and way too liberal. So there's differences of opinion. They can be respected uh, as long as, you know, human dignity goes first. Uh, I did have one client that I actually walked away from. Uh, the way they <clears throat> treated their staff and the way they treated others wasn't going to change. And I said to them, I can't do this. I explained to them why. <clears throat> I would say that client hasn't talked to me since. And that was like mm -hmm. 20 something years ago. I was willing to, that's a risk I had to take. And um, it was a major corporation. And, uh, but I'm glad I did it. I, was, I consider it a badge of honor. But I walked away. I, uh, I'm with you as well on that. I'm, I am curious though. It, it feels to me, as an executive coach that the values you bring are values that I know they're your values, but it feels like that as good humans, caring, learning, family, justice are all good values to be part of the clients yeah. you work with. Or do you just put those? Like, I, that's where I, I, I'm just still a little curious about that. Yeah. In what way? 
well, you said you said I throw my values aside. I I could I could see. I don't know if you throw your values aside. That was the question: Is do you throw okay. your values aside, I or do you throw fun. your your personal opinion on your values aside? But you still believe. Right? Oh yeah, I've, that's yeah. you know I I don't suspend my values because as I said, when they get violated, even by a client, I'm going to know it. So what I wrote in my book inside the box, which is about values and leadership. What I wrote there was that different people will define the same word differently. Respect will mean different things to different people. Trust will mean different things to different people. So and it goes on and on. So just by throwing out the word, and that's the thing that you know sort of irks me about these many corporations. You look at their website, and they all have the same words. They never define them. So, and I've seen this, that different managers in the same organization basically justify what they're doing using the values, but they define them differently. So one says, I did it right. And the other person sitting across the table said, no, you did it wrong. Because they're never taking the time to sit down and say, what do these really mean in real life? Mm. What do these really do for us that tell us? See, I believe once you define your values in an organization, you have defined your code of ethics, your code of conduct. To violate your values, to me, is justifiable grounds to be dismissed. Oh, so, so I'm still with you. Let me continue a second further, though. And that is was really interesting because it's you're not when you say define your values, I think the implication is is that you've also come up with a common language. Yes. That if your value is trust, what does trust really mean? And like, not like not in a Hallmark card sense of trust. All right. And that's not saying anything bad about Hallmark. Oh well, no, they were a client for many years. <laughs> <laughs> I love Kansas City. My roommate from college has moved back to Kansas City. Oh, nice. I, 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 nothing wrong with Kansas City. But um, what I'm saying is you got to go beyond that, define in very simple terms a reflection of what are the actions, the behaviors that define trust within your organization. Mm. So if you do critical incident interviews, which we do with employees, you would find there's a pattern that defines trust. There's a pattern that defines whatever it might be. And what we try to do is by defining what are those behaviors, those actions that people call it, you now have a ca calibrated understanding of right from wrong. I'll give you an example. There was um, one of our clients, a major pharmaceutical organization. Uh, they every year had an offsite and every year they would debate for an hour and a half, two hours, a certain approach to bovine medicine. And should they get involved with what other companies are involved with? And every year for the last umpteen years before this, they always came to the same conclusion at the end, no. So we finished their values, but we finished the behaviors that define their values. There were five values. There was five statements of behavior for each one. And the executive VP of bovine medicine calls the CEO up and says, in reviewing the values, I now see why we always say no to that debate. So take it off the agenda. Hmm. The CEO called me up and said, thank you very much because we never have time to play golf. Now we can at least play nine holes because it's now clear why we always say no and we feel better and good about the fact we say no we're not going to waste our time focusing on it and since then like they always should the organization has always measured every decision they make at every level of the organization against the values are we living our values are we doing the right thing according to our values? And even if we're going to make money off of it, but it violates our values, we're going to say no. Hmm. Or find a way of doing it so it doesn't violate our values. So it becomes a very interesting process. 
because it builds. And the thing is, when you're thinking about leaders, why are leaders successful as leaders? Is they build up trust and respect with their direct reports. So if you have predictability of behavior, it makes it safe to be a leader. It makes it safe to be an employee. And people are not going to be surprised by any of your actions. And they're going to trust that if they do something that's consistent with the values, even if it doesn't turn out right, but it was consistent with the values, you're not going to get angry at them either. So it, it's a way of our values are ingrained in us because over time through our life experiences, we have learned through trial and error the concept of right and wrong. Our values capture what we think is right and also express what is wrong. Organizations are made up of people. So people that might have different ways of looking at the world, but have a common set of behaviors around the, a common set of values, will have a healthy disagreement and will walk away with, from each other with a sense of respect. That's why I always find it interesting is this misnotion, don't hire for values, don't hire for, don't hire for culture. Uh, because culture was defined by, well, that white guy sitting in the office is going to hire other white guys who drive the same car, went to the same school, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what hiring for culture means. You know, you know hiring for fit to values is what makes the difference. Hmm. It got me thinking about something really interesting um, on the on the value front. So let's say that you you or somebody we you sit down with the executives. They they come up with the the set of values that that the company wants to live by, and they externally the company itself they ex, they execute on those values. But then the executives themselves when they go home live by another set of values, values which may be in opposition of the corporate values. Is that, does that work at all? Because I, I answered that question. I have, I have a very strong opinion. I'm so glad you're shaking your head. No, but how, tell me what that, what, what does that mean to you? Well, one of the keys of, of succession planning is a high potential employee has to already live the values of the organization because their behaviors are going to tell people, it goes back to education, there's a concept of hidden curriculum. And the hidden curriculum is the subtle things that happen in, in a school that teach you how to get along with the teacher, how to get along with everybody else, what are the rules, what's the structure, what's the norms of behavior. People are always looking up the organization to see what's flowing down. And if that executive acts inconsistent with the values, it gives other people permission to act inconsistent and you have chaos. And so what happens then, and I've seen this recently with an organization I was working on where the CEO felt he can treat one member of the executive team differently because he needed this person because of their expertise, but because they were acting different, Everybody in that division acted different towards the employees inside also. And people were complaining, don't they get it? They're not, you know, you know, one of the things is that you're supposed to socialize something before you introduce it. Well, they didn't socialize. They just introduced it. And in doing so, changed a whole bunch of things that caught everybody, including customers, by surprise. So they were angry. But when I was asked to talk to him, his rationale was values are aspirational. We're not there yet. So I said to him, well, the reason that people are upset is we define the values according to behaviors that everybody's currently living. And number two is, is that even if they're aspirational, once you put them out there, they're no longer aspirational. They're real. People expect you to live them. Well, let's put it Long story short, I'm not working there anymore because he insisted values are aspirational. And 
you know, mm. we agreed to disagree and that was it. And But that's a problem because some CEOs see this exercise as <coughs> complying or, or fulfilling something that a business school they were taught they were supposed to do or they read in HBR that was supposed to have a value set and a strong culture and it needs stronger results. So we're going to go off and do it. But it's not authentic. And if it's not authentic, it doesn't work. Yeah, this is not an academic exercise. This is how one should live. And, and David, thanks for coming on, even though I know you're still at the tail end of uh, COVID. So thanks for uh, yeah. thanks for joining us. I'm having it now. Making it. What I, I'm thinking about what you do and when, when you go into to an organization, are you are you called in because you wrote the book on values? Are you called in originally? Uh, by companies saying, hey, we need a better value structure? Or what are some of the reasons why companies will will uh, call you in to, to work with them? Yeah, one <clears throat> just uh, project that just finished is that they had organization define their values, but there was a higher single word or hallmark card level. And they knew they had to get it more granular so they can integrate it in a meaningful way with their talent management systems. So we went in. We did our research, talked to executives, talked to employees, came back. We actually do something, which a validation study where we asked employees, do these values really differ, make a difference? These behaviors really make a difference in living the value. Came back, gave it to them. Um, so that at one level, that's one way. Other organizations have called the same because they never been down that road before. Uh, and the current leadership feels they should go down that road. Another organization was a merger of four equals in the sunroof business, automotive business. So there was Holland, there was Germany, there was China and South Korea. Mm. So they said, in order, the leadership said, we got to get together and figure out what we expect from people so they know the ground rules for success. Because it's not a merger, it's not an acquisition, it's actually a new company. That's really fascinating. And oh, it was great. I mean, I went to all of those, I went to all those countries, obviously, um, talked with everybody from the plant floor on up to the, the new executive level. And I'll give you an example of the semantics and power of this. The gentleman, the president of the division of, of from South Korea was fairly quiet, and I wasn't sure his English was that good. Turned out his English was perfect. Um, but he was quiet. He was an introvert. And all of a sudden, one of the other guys on the team gets really excited about, well, if we're going to have, the example was one automaker calls and complains there's noise in the sunroof. So the German automaker complains to the, the head office in Holland. The same German automaker complains to the head office in Dearborn, Michigan. And they're both working on it separately. Even though one's already solved it, the other one's still wasting time on it. So he came up and said, we've got to be seen as one company. So he came up with the concept of ownership. We all own this together. To which the South Korean person started to laugh. And he says, if we have ownership as one of our values, the Korean syntax would be, we're now giving permission to all of our employees to take home whatever they want and not return it. <laughs> so ownership. I, 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 was thinking, I was thinking about the fact that culturally, same words mean such different things, and that was a great example. <laughs> so it was, it was like, what do we come up with? So that's when they came up with, we are one company. We're in this together, and they did. They went very quickly from number three to. Number an accelerator rated number two, just behind number one in their industry, nice. right, like within two years. Um, they went great, it was amazing how they 
we're able to do that. And so cool. values, see, the thing is, is that the mindset is this is that touchy feely bunny hugging stuff that goes along with HR. CEOs have to own this. And this has to be seen as a business tool, which is a foundation for making business decisions. Oh yeah. When you get that, this get my, that mindset in the C-suite that they all own this, they all have to live it 24 seven, whether it work or not. They all have to role model it to everybody. Then you're going to have success with it, but it's not a one and done deal. We've developed a process of bringing our values to life with the organization, which is a socialization of the values, which takes nine months. And by that time, there's a common understanding on everything, how they tie into selection to promotion, performance management, to setting your goals. So they become an essential part of the organization. Nice. Nice. Hey, David, is there a question I should have asked that I didn't? Well, if I had a clear head, I probably could figure that out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on a, a COVID spot. <laughs> uh, no, I think, you know, the, the key point is, to me, is what, are, what do values really mean? So I'm clear on that. And values are the cornerstone of your corporate culture. Because the culture are the norms of behavior that people over time, they influence your rituals, they influence the, even the ergonomics of the organization. So if you don't know what your values are, things change. And you know what, you know, one of the questions you're gonna ask about. Why do people always say, or why do consultants always say, we're going to come in and change your values, change your culture? Well, I don't know anybody <clears throat> in, that ever has woken up in the morning after living their life for 40, 50 years, coming to realize who they are in their value set, woke up one morning, turned the light switch on, and said, I'm going to change my values today. My entire belief system is going to change just because I need a change. Right. That only happens when there's a significant emotional event in one's life that really shakes them to the bone. Which COVID has for some people. But I always kind of smirk when they say we're going to change your culture, because it means you got to change your values, which is the foundation. And that's an evolutionary process. And it doesn't work. I mean, take a look at Home Depot when Nordelli took over. There were people who just said point blank when I interviewed them, we're not bleeding orange anymore. You know, head office is a thousand miles away, but he doesn't understand who we are. We don't bleed orange anymore. And when he left, don't feel sorry for him at $260 million severance package. Um, when he left, he was replaced by a person from GE who first went to the founders and said, listen, what did you guys do to make this place such a loved place? And he went back. That's why I always call this exercise a back to the future exercise. What made you great once can make you great again. Hmm. Oh, it's nice. Well, I love it that you started off with the the core values of you caring learning family and justice and i i believe the in in the great rehire that is as clearly values that that all uh that that we kind of want to live by um i'm just going to say i i don't think there's a work life balance i think there's a life balance well it's it's not a it's a work life what do they call it now? It's not work-life balance anymore. Because people realize one hour for you, one hour at home ain't going to work. It's a work-life continuum. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, so I'm, you and I would disagree. I think there's I, th I think there's just a life continuum. and Because if you don't love what you're doing for work, it's time to find something else. Oh, absolutely agree. Listen, my brother said it best after he went to Europe. 
working for a, a, a strong traditional North American company. And he went to take a look at their new plant in Italy. And he came up and he says, we're moving, his family is moving to Italy. I said, why? He says, because in Italy, they work to live. In America, you live to work. That is a great place to close. So listen, if if you're listening or watching and you recognize the importance of focusing on values for your firm, reaching out to David S. Cohen makes a lot of sense. Uh, David, how best can people reach out to you? Either through our website, which is sagltd.com or through LinkedIn, if they can find me, because there's a lot of David Cohen's. But um, there's a David S. Cohen. That's, a David, that's why I use the middle name, <laughs> the middle initial. <laughs> um, and except there's also a David Cohen that writes The Simpsons, so not that one. <laughs> that's and, right. And, uh, so they can get me through there, or they can just email me at david at sagltd.com. Awesome. David, thanks so much for uh, for joining this episode of Leaders Living Their Values and Sharing Yours. I really appreciate it. My, my pleasure. All right. Hey, uh, thanks again. Listen, this is your time to spread some cred dust. Uh, share this with your friends. Click on the like button, and we'll see you at the next episode. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye now.